son coming in from Florida Bush. Number 16. In the Greg's book. Right back. So let's continue to keep those we mentioned this morning in prayer. Uh, Betty Butler, Kenneth Stanley, Eric Davis, uh, Carol Davis and her passing from the house fire and Donna Taylor. Let's continue to remember those in our prayers. And there are more. Make sure you're looking in your bulletin and uh, on rail. You know, Derek sends out a good many messages for a prayer list. So let's continue to look at that with people that uh, are gonna have issues through the week and need to be prayed for and continue to keep Bob and Mary and Paul and Joanne in your prayers as well. Congratulations to Elliot and Kyla. They were here with us this morning on their uh, marriage. Gonna be a good, uh, good lesson this afternoon, so let's everybody pay attention and listen to this one. We can use it in our daily lives talking with others. Uh, can one lose your salvation? So Derek's gonna present that in just a moment. As we get started, let's go to our Father in prayer. God, we love you and we are so grateful for today and the time that we had to be in our Bible classes this morning and to open your word. We're grateful for the teachers that took time to prepare themselves so they could present those lessons in a way that would be explainable to us and to be able to use the Bible in a way that we can teach others more about you so that we can hopefully bring others to your church as well, Lord. We ask that you continue to be with those that were mentioned on our sick list and those that are in our bulletin. We pray for those that are tending their needs, whether they're sick at home and have caretakers or whether they're in the hospitals and the nurses and the doctors are taking care of them. We pray that those individuals will have the wisdom that you have given them to be able to use and to prevent things happening to them and to gain their health back as soon as possible. We ask that you be with those who have cancer and the situation it puts them in. We know this is a bad time for them and we pray that they can be confident and those that are helping them can also be confident. We're grateful that we have this opportunity this evening to be able to hear Derek present the message. We ask that we listen attentively and that we use what he has to say to us uh, throughout our week and throughout time so we can use this message to be able to use it in our lives daily and present that to others. Continue to be with us as we lift up our prayers and we know you're the great physician and you will take care of us all and we're grateful for that. Continue to be with us as we lift up our voices in song and listen to the message and continue to watch over us as we protect us and guide us in your ways that we will live each and every day of our life according to your word and our obedience to have a heavenly home with you one day. We're grateful for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for each one of us and the forgiveness of our sins. And it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. First song is number 60. 60. Number 60. I had somebody suggest I need to do head and shoulders, knees and toes after the lunch. I said I can't do that under normal conditions, much less after eating. Christ for the world we see.
B78. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Not as blessed as we are. We're just 
So grateful for that blessing, Father. We just pray that you'll give us wisdom and pray that we'll study and be diligent in learning your word, Father, which will give us wisdom. And we just pray for that, that we will help us as we live to, to make the right decisions and do the things that, that please us and glorify you. Father, we do pray for our brothers and sisters here at Zywell and throughout the world. We're so thankful for each, each one of uh, the members here at Zywell. And we do pray and we do have a number who are sick. And Father, we just pray that you'll be with Betty Butler, Father, and be with uh, David, uh, Seal, Jeff, and Davina's dad. We pray that, Father, that you will be with Donna Taylor, Bob, and Mary Allen. You'll continue to be with Hugh and Perry and Annette and Father and be with uh, Beth Pig. We pray, Father, for Jenny Lane and Joanna Paul Leggett. And we also pray, Father, for Wilder's mother, Kendra, and his grandfather, Larry Brown, Father. We pray that you'll be with so many others who are sick that are on the list, that you'll be with them and be with those looking after them, Father. And we do pray for their well-being, Father, and, and the ones that we're not aware of, the things that they're going through uh, might not be physical, but you know what they are, Father, and whatever their needs and problems that they're dealing with, we, we do pray that to help them with those things. We pray, Father, for uh, Eric Davis and Regina also, and that you'll be with uh, Carol Davis's family and the loss of her. You'll be father with Linda Dickinson and her family father and the loss of her mother. And be with any other father that are dealing with grief and, and help them and give them comfort and peace, Father. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will uh, be with all those who expect the mothers. We pray that everything will go well with them and the, and the unborn children, Father, and be with those who are looking after them. That they'll give them the best care and treatment, Father. We pray, Father, for those who are lost spiritually, we pray that you will we'll be able to do things that will uh, help bring your word to them and help them to, to realize their condition and where they're at. And we pray that, Father, that uh, our brothers and sisters who have wandered away, uh, that we can do things and say things that will be helpful to help, help them to come to that realization and get back right with you, Father. Father, we, we do pray for the missionaries that we support, and we pray for those other brothers and sisters who are in the field doing missionary work. We pray for their health, their well-being, Father, and we pray for the work that's being done and that they will be able to, to spread your kingdom and help others come to the knowledge of your work, Father. <coughs> Father, we do pray for our youth. We pray that you'll, for the last the leaders, uh, the ones that participated in that, and they'll take the things that they've learned, Father, and to help them to continue to grow. And we pray that we as parents and grandparents and great-grandparents help, help uh, continue to help our children come up in your word, Father, and to, to grow in your word and to grow in their love for you, Father. Father, we do pray for Elliot and Kyle and their marriage, and we pray that you continue to bless them and help them as they grow a family and they continue to, to serve you in the kingdom, Father. And we pray so much for their marriage. Uh, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will uh, be with our country, be with our troops and those serving, to keep peace in our country, Father. And we pray for the things that's going on in the world right now. And we pray for all those uh, innocent people, Father, in those different countries that have no control of the things that's going on pray for them, especially our brothers and sisters in those different areas. Father, we do pray for our visitors, and we pray that you'll continue to help them as they uh, come back and might hopefully one day come back and worship with us, Father, and help them to be safe in their travels, Father. And Father, we do ask that you please forgive us any and all sins that we have, and that we'll always be mindful of the, our, what we're doing and how we're living, and that we'll always uh, recognize the things that we do wrong and that we'll return from and, and, and ask for forgiveness, Father. Thank you again for your love and care, Father. And we pray again that our worship pleases you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
This afternoon, if you're using a songbook and want to mark the invitation song, it'll be number 21. That will be the song after the lesson, number 21. And before, we'll sing 662. 662 verses 1 and 4. If you will, please stand. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. Good afternoon. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I know you ate good if you stayed here and ate lunch here, so, uh, so that's good. Uh, don't fall asleep on us. We'll try to get out of here in a reasonable time. But uh, this afternoon, we have a really important question we need to talk about and consider. Uh, it's a question that maybe you've asked yourself before, uh, maybe not now, but maybe at a, at a younger age. Uh, maybe it's a question that your friends are asking, that people at work or uh, family members uh, have come up to you and they've discussed this question with you. Uh, this is part of our Have You Ever Wondered series uh, of questions we do. Um, we're doing it this way, uh, this time, and next time, you, you don't know. Next time, it might be both of us up here again. Uh, but I uh, just wanted to uh, take some time this afternoon uh, to look at a really important question and look at something that I think will help us uh, in our walk with, with God for our knowledge, but also as we go out in the world and how we can help other people uh, learn about God too. And so the question really before us is, have you ever wondered if you can lose your salvation? Uh, and that is something that a lot of people have asked. Like I said, maybe that's something you've asked, but it's definitely something that people around us ask. Because we hear people saying things like that all the time, uh, you know, whether it's online, whether it's in person, whether it's friends, family, we hear people talking about this. And in our context, in our area, in this vicinity of Jackson, Mississippi, and being in the south part of the United States, especially the southeastern part of the United States, you know, we run into various denominations that are out there. Uh, but a lot of them fall under really the, kind of an overall umbrella of Calvinism. Uh, and they fall under an umbrella of having a Calvinistic uh, viewpoint uh, of life, uh, of salvation, of God, of everything related to God and his word. Um, and Calvinism is generally res, uh, kind of relayed uh, in the following terms. At least this is what you kind of get some descriptive terms when talking about salvation. You have first, uh, you have the acronym TULIP. Uh, and in the TULIP, it talks about total depravity, uh, meaning that, you know, from the get-go, before you're ever born, that as a person's born, they're totally depraved. Uh, then unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, or as some would talk about, you know, once saved, always saved, or, you know, falling from grace, losing your salvation, uh, so on and so forth. And so you see how Calvinism really ties in directly with our question because as you go through that acronym of TULIP and you look at each individual thing, such as total depravity, such as unconditional election, each one of those really carries within it this idea that, you know, hey, I'm a sinner and I've always been a sinner. Even before I was born, as I was, as I was born, I, was, I inherited sin and I'm a sinner and I'm lost and there's nothing I can do about it. And since there's nothing I can do about it, you know, I need God. God gave a free gift. It was given. Nobody can take it away from me because he gave it. 
you can kind of, it all points back towards the ending here of once saved, always saved. And they use a lot of verses, a lot of scriptures and stuff that are used and that are misused to represent this type of teaching, this type of doctrine, uh, and that is used to really um, sometimes confuse people that haven't studied it for themselves. And for the ones that have studied it, some will even use this doctrine to trick people, to trick them into believing something that just is not what the Bible teaches. So today I want us to start to look at some of these things. We can't, we can't explore all of it. I want us to look at some of these things that are taught within Calvinism. And then I want us to talk about this question of, can I lose my salvation? Uh, is once saved, always saved? Is that really uh, the case according to Scripture? So first, let's turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 is a verse that I think a lot of people, especially uh, in the, you know, this religious area uh, around, the, around the world would believe in, you know, for all of a sin to fall short of the glory of God. I don't think many people you're going to run in contact with on a day-to-day basis are going to disagree with you about that. You know, that we all sin. I think a lot of people really connect with this and understand this. If they're religious at all, many people in our area are going to agree that we've all sinned. Where the difference comes in is like when you go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 18. You see, there's a lot of people in our world that they truly believe that sin has been inherited from Adam. Uh, and that Adam and Eve, they sinned there in the Garden of Eden, and therefore every person after them was guilty of that sin, of that original sin, of that sin that he committed there, that Eve committed there, uh, and that we are guilty from the get-go. Uh, Romans 5.18 says uh, this, that uh, sin entered through one man. Uh, uh, no, no, it says, therefore, as, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act. The free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. And so they'll just cherry pick right out of this and say, see here, you know, through one man's offense, uh, judgment came to all men. Okay, judgment is there. So they'll say, hey, listen, you inherited sin. You inherited an Adam's sin. And they'll just kind of stop there. They won't read the whole context. They won't read the whole chapter. They'll just read just a little, little excerpt from this, this verse and say, see here, you're guilty of Adam's sin. Well, then they'll go on in their thinking and maybe leave the idea of a sin being inherited, but then they'll go on and talk about that gift, you know, because they're here, total depravity, total depravity. Everybody's depraved from the get-go. And so they'll say, see here, we needed a gift. Jesus was that gift. And so they'll maybe turn to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, where it says the wage of sin is death, which they would agree with, but the gift of God or the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's a verse we use all the time, but for so many people in our world, they'll turn to that verse and say, see there, it's a gift and it's free. And since the, I was lost before I was even born, uh, and since Christ gave me a gift, there ain't nothing anybody else can do to take this from me because it's been given. And you think about people, uh, God giving a gift. You turn to John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this just adds another element to it. They see, you see here, God gave a free gift. That gift was Jesus Christ. Uh, and through him, we have everlasting life. And since it's everlasting or it's eternal, once again, you can't take it from me. And that's the doctrine that kind of gets put out there and gets kind of twisted. And these are using the exact same verses that you and I love and cherish uh, and know when you read the entire context of a verse and use it as God intended it for it to be used, you know that's not exactly what's being taught. But yet that's what so many people will teach. And then this verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is a verse that so many uh, fall in this Calvinistic uh, viewpoint are going to love to turn, turn to. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Once again, they're going to pull from this verse and say, see, you're saved by grace. Some may, in conversations, repeat and say it's saved by grace through faith, but their interpretation of faith and my interpretation of faith, or not interpretation, my judgment based on what God's word has said, what faith is, they're not going to line up. And so here they're going to present it as you're saved by grace. It's not of works. You know, no one can boast about this. It's nothing you can do. It doesn't take much 
much twisting, much, much manipulating, much confusion to take the same verses that you and I love and cherish, to take them and just twist them just enough to say, you see, we were doomed from get-go and God gave a free gift. He gave a free gift that, that we can take pl- place of and no one can ever take it from us. And you can understand why a lot of people would believe in once saved, always saved. Now they believe in salvation. A lot of people will turn for salvation that believe in this mindset will turn to like Romans chapter 10, verses nine and 10, where it says that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes into righteousness and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. And there's a lot of people who say, see, you know, this is what you have to do. This is, this is all you have to do. You just gotta, you know, some will say, accept Jesus into your heart, confess his name, and he's your Lord and Savior forever. You've received that gift, can't be taken from you. It doesn't matter what happens. Now, that's putting it in my words, but that's really ultimately what's been taught by so, so many. And then you come down to John chapter 10 and verse 28. John chapter 10, verse 28 really is used a lot to really try to support this idea of a C. It's a gift, it's been given, and it can't be taken from you. You can't go against Jesus. And it says, I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. God's people. How can someone take away God's people? They're God's, they belong to him. You see, you can take just about any verse you want and you can try to make it say what you want it to say. But in us, in order to be faithful before God, we have to look at things and we have to look at the entire context and we have to look at what God has actually teaching and what he's actually showing us. And that's what we have to teach. God is the giver of truth. He's also the giver of salvation. But that salvation is through Jesus and unlike so many there is something we must do. And there is something that we must uh, be in order to have the salvation that's in him. And so that just mentions some of the confusion and false teaching that's out there in the world. It doesn't mention everything. We, we don't have time for that. So now we want to offer some corrections. We want to offer some corrections and the truth about salvation in regard to this question. Is once saved, always saved? Is that really the way things are? Or can I... Can I fall from grace? So let's start with this. Romans chapter three, verse 23 uh, reads, like we've always said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But as we keep on going down, it says, being justly are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previous, previously committed. And so once again, we read this verse talking about all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But notice where that redemption is found. That redemption that is being found here is found in Christ Jesus. It is something that, that, it, that is going to be, to be given to those that are in him, going to be given to the faithful uh, and was set forth as a propitiation or as that, that blood price that was given by the blood of Jesus that it was the blood of Jesus that was shed for the sins of many. And we needed to get into him in order to have that cleansing, in order to have, you know, uh, that security and that salvation uh, that is provided in him. You know, our sins that we commit, well, they're just that. They're sins we commit, not sins we inherit. When you look at Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, and we don't have time to read all of that, this is not telling us that we inherit sins uh, from Adam. It says, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Every single one of us sinned. Every single one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, there are consequences from the death of Adam, I mean, for the sins of Adam and Eve, consequences of being kicked out of the garden, consequences uh, for them, you know, their eyes were open, they were, they were made to wear clothes. Uh, there are consequences that, that we face because of them. But guess what? Our, our guilt, our status of being lost is not based on the sins of Adam. It's based on the sins of us. 
It's based on the sins that each and one of us uh, have committed. In fact, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 25 says, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Because we're going to be judged based on our sins, not on the sins of Adam, not on the sins of our fathers, not on the sins of any other man, but on the sins that we have committed. But notice this, we said we needed to get redemption through where? Redemption's found in Christ Jesus. So we need to listen to him, which is exactly what the father said for us to do in Matthew chapter 17 and verse five. It says, this is his beloved son in whom he is well pleased, hear him. Now, what does Jesus tell us to do? What does Jesus tell us to do for salvation? What does he tell us to do in order to have our sins washed away? Well, first, we start with John chapter 14, verse 15. I think this is a verse that our religious neighbors love and cherish. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, that's something that that we need to love and cherish as well. But we also need to identify what commandments he has told us to do. That he's not just telling us to say, Lord, Lord. In fact, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does what? Does the will of the Father. That's who is going to have that eternal life, is those that do the will of the Father. And that sets up this idea of conditions. See, so many people in the world, when they talk about once saved, always saved, or not being able to fall away, or you know, perseverance to the saints, you know, they talk about this idea as, as a way of defense, is that you're trying to put conditions on things. You're trying to say that you have to do something, that you have to work it out, that you have to, well, guess what? God put conditions on things. God said right here in this, in his, from his own mouth that it's not just about saying, Lord, Lord, but it's about doing his will, which sets forth before us a, a kind of clause that shows if you do this, you will be saved. If you do not, you will be condemned. We need to see the conditions that the Lord has set before us. You can read more about those conditions found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We read that a moment ago, and we see that we're saved by grace through faith. So we don't have the luxury of just pulling grace of faith apart right here and saying it's grace only, which is what so many people teach. But the reality is, is this says grace through faith. Well, what is faith? When you look in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, you, you see that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then you go on down to verse 6, and you see that without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, then you read the rest of this chapter, and what are you going to find out? That God's people under various different times and different uh, you know, time periods of, of him communicating to people, that here they had to do what? They had to obey. In order to be faithful, they had to hear and they had to obey. And time and time again, as you go through Hebrews chapter 11, it's going to point to the fact that faith is going to be demonstrated, is going to be had in obedience. Because if there's no obedience, it's just an intellectual belief. It's just an intellectual acknowledgement that there is a God. But James chapter 2 and verse 19 says, even the demons believed, but the demons didn't obey. The demons shuddered in fear, and yet the demons still didn't do what God told them to do. And so therefore, they weren't faithful. But God has redeemed us, those that are come to him through faith. And we need to understand that salvation is for those that, that obey. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 says this, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now we're going to read here in the next several verses, numerous passages over and over and over again that show us how to obey God, that demonstrate to us the conditions that he has set before us and what we must do to have that eternal life. You know, earlier we read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And it's true. He did love the world. And Jesus is the greatest gift this world will ever know. But keep on coming down into that, uh, that chapter and going down to verse 36. And as you get on down to, uh, to John chapter 3 and verse 36, we see that both belief and obedience 
are required for those that are going to be faithful. And you're going to see that, especially if you're reading from the English Standard Version or the American Standard Version, uh, it does uh, this word a whole lot better when defining obedience. We need to obey God. Now, when we talk about hearing and obeying God, what do we talk about in the church? Well, in the church, we talk about, a lot of people say, well, the plan of salvation. So we say, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Uh, you know, you, you got to believe, believe in Jesus, Mark 16, 15 and 16. You got to repent, Luke 13, 3. Uh, you got to confess Jesus, Romans 10, 9 and 10, or Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Uh, you got to be baptized in the mission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. And those are typical verses that we will use. And I don't rush through them to make light of them. But I think there's things that we're very familiar with. My question in all of those verses, can you remove any of them? Can you take any of them out? If God says that we need to hear the son, and the son says that if you love me, you're going to keep my commands, and then I'm going to cherry pick, well, grace only, or I'm going to cherry pick some other aspect of this and say, this is how I'm saved. Does that end up at salvation or does it end up being a false doctrine? When we try to twist or manipulate out of ignorance or even out of an intentional misuse of God's word, we are not properly representing what God has told us to do in order to be saved. This idea of once saved always saved, has confused so many people. It's confused them, for one, because they misinterpret and think they have been lost from the beginning. It, mis- it, it, it confuses them even more because they miss on how to be saved to begin with. And then not only do they miss on how to be saved to begin with, but then they miss what you must continue to do as a saved one in Christ. So some have said they're sinners from the very beginning. Some have taught falsely a way to be saved through grace only. And then we come to the part that we're really dealing with today is once you are truthfully saved, can you fall from grace? Well, I want to look at a few passages. A few passages to talk about this. Can you fall from grace? Can you lose your salvation? Now, we'll say this. Your salvation has to be true and has to be according to the word of God, but can you lose it? Once you have it, because that's the question we're answering today, once you have it, can you lose it? Well, let's look at a few passages. First John chapter 1 and verse 7. First John chapter 1 and verse 7. But if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, when you look at this verse, what we're actually saying is, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and it's a continual walk, day by day, moment by moment, year by year, until the Lord comes back, we're going to continually walk in him. So that's a condition, right? It says, but if we walk in the light, which sets forth a condition that if you do not, the opposite of this is going to be true. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and his blood uh, cleanses us. But that also sets up that if we do not walk in the light and keep walking in the light, that we're going to face the opposite of this. If we have cleansing one way, the other way we're going to have condemnation. But what's another verse we, uh, we can see? First John chapter 5, verse 18, tells us that if, if we're his, if we belong to Christ, then we're not going to keep on sinning. Now, depending on the translation that you're, that you're reading or the version you're reading from, uh, the wording might, might be a little confusing there, but as you get down to it, it's really trying to, co- to communicate that we're not going to be in the habit of sinning, in the continual lifestyle of sinning, because we all do sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We find ourselves uh, in sin, but if we think that once saved, always saved— is a legitimate doctrine and teaching, then what's the point of even trying? What's the point of getting up tomorrow and deciding to live for God? What's the point of going to services somewhere? 
What's the point of doing any of those things if I believe in once saved, always saved? What would be the point? Now, we'll get to some arguments about that later, but when you look at this, if I'm saved, I can't turn around and go back and live in the world as I once lived. The scripture here tells me to, to don't continue to sin. Now, we see that our generation is not the only generation that's ever struggled with this idea. When you turn over to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, you had people, obviously, that were, they were trying to, you know, just sin so grace could abound. And the opposite is told them. They said, you cannot keep doing this. He said, should you continue in sin that grace may abound? The answer is certainly not. We cannot continue to live a life of sin if we are in a saved place with God. We must put those things away and continue to walk before him because there are conditions. And the conditions are of us walking faithfully before him. Now, as we look at this, I love Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4 literally says, falling from grace. So if somebody ever asks you, can you fall from grace? I suggest you turn to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4 because it literally verbatim says, falling from grace. It's about as clear as you can get when it comes to this that yes, you can fall from grace. Or as Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12 puts it, depart living, uh, d- depart from the living God. You can fall from grace. You can walk unfaithfully. You can depart from the living God. All of these things are true. And if these things are true, then that means that once saved, always saved is not true. It is not an accurate teaching of God. And if it was, then why restore someone? Why passages such as Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1? Galatians chapter 6 and 1, 1 tells us who are spiritual to restore such a one. Restore them, so that means they were part of the church before, they have fallen away, and then I, my responsibility is to go and help restore them back to the fold. If once saved, always saved is true, why restore them? Why seek after them at all? It wouldn't make sense. Another passage that wouldn't make sense is James chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. Why even pray for these people? James chapter 5 and verse 16 talks about, you know, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then it comes on down there to verses 19 and 20, talking about that when we do this and we have helped restore someone, that, you know, we've turned that sinner and we can save them through this process. If once saved, always saved was true, why even pray for them? Why try to turn them back? And how would that affect their salvation? You can kind of see here very clearly, once saved, always saved is not an accurate teaching. But the reality is, is this. The reality is, is that yes, we have to be saved through Jesus Christ, through the commands in which he told us to save, uh, to be saved by. But we have to continue to walk in that light as he is in the light, which means, yes, there are conditions that are set before us, conditions in order to be saved and conditions in order to continually be saved in a safe place before him. We cannot say that once saved, always saved is an accurate teaching. If it was, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5, where they demonstrate some church discipline on casting out those that are uh, committing sins in their midst, that verse wouldn't even be necessary. Why discipline somebody if it's not possible to fall from grace? Why would you have passages such as 2 Peter chapter 2 20 and 21, where it says it's going to be much worse for them that knew and then fell away. Or Hebrews 10, verse 29, that says that they will receive a worse punishment having known and then having fall away. You see, once saved, always saved just does not hold up to Scripture. We can fall from grace. But for us, really for the whole world, I don't want anybody to fall from grace. And that's not what Jesus wants either. He wants all to come to salvation. 
He wants all to hear the gospel. He wants all to believe the gospel. He wants them all to be saved in Christ. And our job as teachers, as preachers, as fellow Christians is not to go in the world and try to to show someone, see here, you're just wrong, 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 wrong. No, we're going to go out there in the world and we're going to teach them what's right, 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 because they need to see Jesus. And they need to see the salvation that he offers. See how it's offered through him? through his blood, and that's a continual obedience to him. Now, something that I think that gets um, a lot of Christians in trouble is they'll turn to 2 Peter 1 and verse 10. And in 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, you know, we talk about our call and election being sure. And as you see there, your call and election can be sure. Your salvation can be secured. And I would agree with that idea. Our salvation can be secured, but it's not by grace only. It's not by, you know, an unconditional election that I had nothing to do with and no part to play in it. No, but it's by us being faithful and obedient to him. It says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. Why would you need Diligence. Why would you need work? Why would you need effort if you had nothing to do with it at all? But it says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. We have the ability to be sure of our salvation. And so that's a message that the whole world needs to hear. They need to hear about the salvation that's in Christ. They need to hear about the obedience that he requires And they need to hear about the surety that we believe in our salvation. I don't want the world to think that those in the church don't believe salvation is secure. I want them to know that we believe salvation is secure. But how that salvation is secure is through Christ Jesus and through our obedience to him and to his word. Now, so many will at this point love to throw in our face about, well, y'all just believe in works a work salvation. You're just going to work your way to heaven. They'll use passages such as Romans 3 or verse 20 or Galatians 2 verse 15 to 21. But really what they need to understand is, is we have in the New Testament passages that deal with the works of the law versus the works that are in Christ Jesus. Okay? They have salvation and then they have what we must do in order to be found obedient. All right, and so we can't separate the two. The best passage I think for us to understand is this. Now, first, let me say this. We're not saved by works of the law. In fact, the works of the law did not offer uh, salvation that was not found within the law. But we do have salvation is in Christ Jesus. And now in Christ Jesus, do we have to work? Do we have to show our faith? Well, James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26 says, says we do. Starting there in verse 18, says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God and you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working uh, together with uh, faith was working together uh, with his works, and by works faith was made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by by works and not by faith only. We need to show people in a very positive kind of way that our faith is going to be shown by our works. It's going to be shown by our walk, by our continual faithful walk to him each and every day. No, the doctrine of once saved, always saved is not a correct teaching, is not a correct doctrine. But if you truly walk in the light as he is in the light, if you are combining faith and your works together day by day, living for him, you can be assured of your salvation. And that's a message that the world needs to hear. Today, I hope 
we've helped in some way. In some way, help you have some answers for those that are asking, can you lose your salvation? Yes, you can. But can you have salvation and be secured of it in Christ? Absolutely. But we have to obey, and we have to continue walking with him each and every day. Today, if there's anything we can do for you, whether prayers to the church, or today you want to put on Christ in baptism, please come as we stand and as we sing.
Help us to remember to put you uh, foremost in our lives and, and make that known to everyone. I ask that you would be with those that are suffering right now, be with those that are sick, uh, both at home and in the hospital. I pray that you would return them to full health. I pray that we would be a comfort to them while they're struggling. I pray that you would be with those that have suffered loss recently. I pray that you would continue to watch over the, the leadership of this congregation, the elders, and, and help them to make the right decisions uh, so that this congregation can, can be the best that it can here. I pray that you would watch over us as we go our separate ways and help us to return at the next point in time.